Hey, hello, and welcome or welcome back to the Night Sky Knitting Channel. My name is Rachel, I am your host, and I am a knitter based out of Ottawa, Canada, and this channel is my chatty outlet to talk all things knitting with occasional guest appearances by other crafts. Today is Saturday, April 8th, right smack in the middle of a holiday long weekend here, and I'm just in a really good mood, and I wanted to film. I have three finished objects and a couple new or recently resurfaced whips. And I don't know, I'm just feeling really energized and inspired. It's actually spring here. We had a really gnarly ice storm that left a lot of people without power earlier in the week. But right now the sun is shining, the birds are singing, the sky is blue. And I'm just feeling quite inspired right now. I, I feel that reawakening that comes with spring. I've been really enthusiastic about writing my papers. I've been really enthusiastic about knitting all sorts of different things. And I'd like to share that enthusiasm with you. So, okay, without much further ado, my first finished object, I am so proud to be able to show you guys. I did it. I finished, I finished the crochet throw blanket. I finished the sunburst granny square blanket that I have been working on since January of 2021. So here it is. There are a couple loose little threads. This end is woven in. However, I wove this in ages ago and I'm not willing to trim it because I don't know if I trust uh, 2021 Rachel's weaving and end skills and I've decided I don't care. But here, I obviously cannot have this entire thing in frame, but every square is joined. There is a half double crochet border and then a chain one, slip stitch one, chain one, slip stitch one um, border with the rainbow contrast color on the ends. And I used Sirdar Hayfield Spirit in the color, I wanna say Sundown, as this color changing accent yarn or main yarn. And Haydar Baby Chunky, both of these are a chunky yarn in the color cream, which is discontinued and was when I bought it two years ago from Wool Time here in Ottawa as the border color. And I love it. Uh, this was a marathon to finish just because I started this when I was falling a little bit out of love with crochet and more into knitting. And so work on this was very sporadic for those over for those two years. I'd work on it a bunch for a little bit and then not pick it up for months at a time. And I finally managed to get to that final burst this past week. I was watching one of Retro Claude's videos, one of her new releases, I think it was her video on Finish It February and she was doing some crochet. And I just felt really inspired even though it was the last day of March when I watched that video. And we had long since finished Finish It February watching her finish some stuff or attempt to finish some stuff made me think, you know what I'm gonna do right now while I watch this video? Work on this blanket and see how far I get. And I just kept saying like, okay, I'll just connect one last row. And then when I finished that one last row, I only had one more row to connect. So I thought might as well do that. And then I thought, oh, well, all I have to do is add a border. So then I just, and then one thing led to another and I spent the whole evening crocheting. And by the time the it hit, I think I started at like 5.30 after work and by the time 11 rolled around, having taken breaks to shower and eat dinner and talk on the phone, I was done. All the crochet. And then it took me another three days of weaving and ends, spending like a couple hours max. It's like a very generous estimation to weave in the ends. And then it's now been washed and laid up to dry and it's done and it's been living in the living room and I'm thrilled. It makes me so happy to see it. I'm very, very happy with how it ended up. I'm gonna try and stand to give you an idea of like the shape of it, but it's kind of long and skinny. And then it's about, it's about my height and I'm 156, 157 centimeters. I would say this is five feet tall and I don't know, three feet across, maybe four. I don't know if that's right. I'm happy with it. I think it's about the size of a twin bed. It's more of a one person 
throw, but I'm quite, quite happy with it. And I was not quite playing yarn chicken, but I only had one ball left of the cream, which has been discontinued for years when I was joining the squares and then to do the border. And I don't have a lot left. Uh, what I do have left is currently in the freezer because later I will tell you about the carpet beetle infestation in my room, but we'll get there. And I used up almost all of both yarns, which makes me happy with the choices I made and how many squares to make and to do it to be make it kind of narrow but long because that meant I had the exact amount I needed for the squares, the border, and this fun little rainbow accent. It really only took me one evening and then a few hours of weaving and ends every once in a while. And I usually did that like first thing in the morning when I was having my coffee when I was not really in the headspace to do knitting or thinking and I just wanted something to do with my hands. But as soon as I started to get resentful or annoyed about weaving and ends, I'd stop and just pick it up another day because I wanted to make sure I wasn't sloppy with my end weaving, despite the little, the little ones you'll see here and there, like this, because I wanted to make sure it's secure. So this yarn is, well, both of these yarn have the same blend and I want to say that's 80% acrylic, 20% wool. It might be 70-30, and that wool is super wash. I did this intentionally. I want my homeware to be easier to care for and easier to wash, especially a blanket. So I washed this on the wool cycle anyway in our machine, which I'm very grateful has a wool cycle because most North American machines don't, at least in my experience. And totally fine, no problems, but I want ends to be secure because it might go through a washer dryer. Well, not dryer, might go through a washer. And I'm thrilled, it's warm, it's cozy. People comment on it when they come in and are generally positive, though I don't think they'd say anything mean about it to my face. And I'm thrilled. I will link the pattern down below, but I was inspired by a whole bunch of these that I saw on the r slash crochet subreddit back in the day. And I'm just so happy that it's done. And there were so many times where this was hanging over me as an unfinished object or a long-term whip. Every, but every time I would work on it again, I would, I would think, oh yeah, this is actually a lot of fun. And I do enjoy crochet. Just for whatever reason, I find it really hard to pick up my hook again. But now that I have my one crochet project done, I can start another cro crochet project soon. And I'm looking forward to that. I really hope I have this for years and years to come. I did a back loop only single crochet join which has a very defined ridge on the wrong, the, on the wrong side, but it's not it's reversible, it's, it's just the back. And I don't love that, but I like it more after it had been blocked out. Kind of has like almost a window pane effect in my opinion, but I really, really like the effect on the right side of that join. And it just gave it a little bit more space in my opinion, as opposed to sewing it or doing a slip stitch border and I'm very happy with that choice and oh, I'm very happy. I know I said that about a thousand times, but it is what I wanted and hoped it would be. So yeah, I'm quite pleased. My other finished object you guys saw as an almost finished object and I did not expect to have it to show you guys in person, but this is the octopus that I made for my coworker for her soon to be born baby that I knit in some Lion brand mercerized cotton and then used some Patton's Croy for embroidering on the eyes and the smile. And this is a Yarnigans or Rachel. I wrote down the designer's name in the description box of my last video because I forgot the designer's last names again. And I thought this time I'll remember, and I have once again forgotten. I know that the designer's first name is also Rachel. I know that this was done in collaboration with War 4 Yarnigans, and I have once again forgotten. But this is the octopus pattern. It'll be linked down below. I really like it. It was fun. It was straightforward. Even though my embroidery leaves a lot to be desired, I think it's really cute. And I'm very excited to give this to my coworker. The reason why she doesn't have it, and I have it, is because her last week at work before starting parental leave, her older child was sick, so she was at home with him, 
And so I'll either catch her when she comes back to hand in her laptop or we'll meet up for coffee and then I can give this little one to her for her baby. But yeah, I do recommend this pattern if you enjoy stuffed toys, if you want like a starter plushie, or if you have a gift giving occasion and the recipient would enjoy a soft toy octopus. The only thing is there were about a million ends to weave in and I was panic weaving in these ends at the beginning of my work day, which was fun because we were hosting a meeting and people were like, oh, or, you know, it was a good conversation starter. And one of the coworkers who was there was like, I also have knit coworkers, little octopi for or octopuses, but I think it's octopi for their new babies. So we had a good uh, conversation about that and shared patterns. And I learned she's, oh, and this person is the first left-handed knitter I've met in person. I don't mean a knitter who is left-handed. I mean, someone who knits from counterclockwise the way I do. And she's not a lefty herself, but her mother is and taught her to knit the way that her mother knit, which is left-handed. And so that was really cool. So I met my first left-handed knitter in person. We both have made octopi stuffed, stuffed toys for coworkers expecting children. And that was really nice. So here it is, very happy and used up a good amount of this uh, thrifted Lion brand cotton that had otherwise been sitting in stash. So I'm quite pleased. So that's my finished object. Number two, it's been a good week for finishing things or a good, sometimes it feels like everything is just in ongoing and ongoing and ongoing and I have no finished objects to show you guys and then everything is done all at once like within a three day period. And that brings us to our final finished object, which maybe I, uh, maybe I faked you guys out a little bit. Maybe I'm wearing a store-bought sweater to make you think that I had not finished any garments but actually I had. So this is my step-by-step -step sweater by Florence Miller of the Handmade by Florence podcast that I knit in Emily C. Gilly's Maritime Erin in the color Nimbus. Here is the ball band. I've noticed when I edit these videos that often when I meant to say ball band, I'll say button band because I've been working on so many cardigans and just saying and thinking about button bands, but yeah. Here it is. I haven't woven in this last end because I keep forgetting. And I'm medium happy with it. I'm gonna put it on and then we'll talk. So here it is. I prefer to tuck the turtleneck collar inwards because outwards I think it looks a little strange. Maybe not, maybe it's just in my head. But this is what it looks like. It's a two stitch raglan. Aaron weight, one by one rib, pretty standard. And I've worn it twice. And part of the reason why I wanted to film today beyond free time and sunshine and being in a good mood is I kind of wanted to talk to you guys about this before I re-block it. I think it hangs a little funny and I think it's because of how I blocked this. So earlier this week, I discovered a number of carpet beetle larvae in my house. I will skip the bug talk to a dedicated bug talk section after this because a lot of people don't want to hear about bugs, which is totally fair. And I will have that like timestamp so you can skip it later. But I was blocking this when I found them and they eat yarn. And this was lying flat on my floor on a blocking mat. And I did not want to leave it lying flat on a blocking mat to be eaten. So this was moved around and manipulated a bunch while blocking that otherwise it wouldn't have been had there not been extenuating circumstances. And I think as a result, it didn't block out the way I wanted. And I'm hoping it's just a blocking issue and I can re-block it now that the carpet beetles are gone. Knock on wood. Because I think it hangs a little funny. So first of all, You'll see here, you can see where I did the two rounds of increase, decreases, you know, here and here, and then it flares back out again. And I don't know why, because it didn't, I didn't then increase out again to achieve a boom, boom shape. And I think it's because I, I tugged at the bottom and it, it looks a little funny and it means that it kind of, 
I don't like that. I don't like what it's doing right there. I don't think it looks nice. Obviously these pants were meant for the beige sweater that I was wearing, but I don't love that, the way that it's sitting. I also don't like the bunching that's happening a little bit along the raglan line. And it's kind of flaring out at the back. I'm wondering if that's a bind off issue. Yeah, I like it, but I think it could be better. I wore it both times I wore it this week to snuggle up. I wore it with a French tuck because I feel like that helps a little bit. You can also see this fold where it got creased during being moved around. And I did want the turtleneck to be a bit bigger. I measured it against, wait, why am I moving my hair forward when the point is to show you the neck? I did measure it against my seed stitch dicky that I also made with a turtleneck and it's the same length and the same width, but I'm wondering if it's just a difference in fiber composition that has made this a bit shorter and stiffer than that one. Whereas the collar of the dicky is for me a perfect turtleneck, like perfect chunky turtleneck in a sweater. And I would like that a little bit more. And I'm again wondering if I reblock it and I tug, it'll loosen up a bit. I also think that'll just loosen with wear as I'm pulling it on and off my head, the stitches will stretch. So I'm not too concerned about that. I also don't mind this kind of funnel effect, but yeah, I really, really loved the yarn. I did forget to mention last time when I spoke about it, that it has the most hay and plant matter to pick out of any yarn I have used. So I would normally just, after unwinding the hank, I'd do a sweep when all the, the yarn was in a big circle and get most of it out that way. But I did have to take many breaks before I started doing that to pick out hay. And so if that annoys you, I think that you should maybe skip this yarn, but I really, really like it. It's not itchy, but it's not one of those soft yarns. So I feel like it'll have some more durability. I love this color. I think it's beautiful. I really stop and look at it a lot. And I think I'll knit with it again. I also did not need a lot to make a pretty big sweater. I also knit normal sleeves, not bracelet length sleeves to suit this like snuggly over sweater vibe. And yeah, I like it. I gave it a couple days and a couple wears to see if I would change my mind about the strange shaping around the waist with wear. And I have gotten used to it because sometimes you just need to wear something a couple times and then, and then I think, oh yeah, no, this, this fits in my wardrobe the way I expected it to. It's comfortable, it's warm, it's practical and I like it. But I do think I'm gonna reblock it since I have the time and the space and the sunshine and see if that helps a little bit. If it doesn't, I don't think that's the end of the world. Does that make sense? I'm wondering if I, I mean, I have enough yarn. I could also just knit it longer and see if I like that and have it go down to kind of like the top of my legs, way past my hips. I wonder if I would like that more. It would be pretty easy to cut and graft in another section of stockinette above the rib. I don't know. Anyway, I recommend this pattern. I recommend this yarn. I don't recommend having carpet beetles. So those are my three finished objects. Uh, whips. First whip is one I am excited, intimidated, and intimidated to start tackling again. And it's the camisole I knit for my mother in the autumn that I then had to rip all the way back to the body, where the body would start, because I made it way too big because I didn't knit a gauge swatch and I suffered for it which is an incredibly avoidable mistake and entirely my fault. So here are the needles and the ball of yarn. And I think this evening I'm going to cast on for the back, join all of it, and then do the distinctive Y and like V shapes on the body that this camisole is known for, hopefully in time for the second week of May and my mother's birthday. The reason why I haven't done it yet 
is because I remember at the time, and I was quite sleep deprived for most of the time I was working on the distinctive shaping with the decreases along the front of this camisole, but I remember making a lot of mistakes and needing to take back and having to pay attention. And so I'm waiting for good sunshine and having the presence of mind to start that over, especially since I don't have the stitch markers where they were before, because at the time I put them along with following the pattern. And at this point I ripped out the whole thing. So I don't know if that was coherent, but I hope you guys get what I mean. But the yarn is really nice. It's a silk linen blend, it's fingering weight, from a dyer that no longer exists and I got secondhand. And it's a very my mother color and she likes summer tops and this is broken rib and I enjoy broken rib. So I would like to get that done sooner rather than later. But having frogged it, lifted a big weight from my shoulders because I had been thinking about doing that since I first blocked it and knew that it was the completely wrong shape and knew that I needed to fix it at some point. One commenter suggested or asked why I didn't just sew up the sides to make it much narrower. And normally that would be a great suggestion. However, it was both way too wide and too short. So the way to fix that would be rip it back all the way to where the body would start, reduce the amount of stitches for the body and then have much more length and much less width, which is what I need, but yeah. On the subject of fingering weight summery camisoles, I have started the Twist Loop Top by Other Loops, which I'm knitting with a friend of mine in Knitting for All of Cot Merino in the color Soft Aqua. This is about three or four days of work, but not very intense work because I have had finals and other knitting priorities. And it has been a lot of fun. So it's a three by two rib pattern with this cable panel running down the middle of the front. And I have been enjoying the construction of this, but there are a couple translation things that have kind of made me pay a little bit more attention to the pattern. Once I realized it was fine, but there are just a couple of knitting conventions that like weren't in English patterns that were not followed that made me do a double take at first. For example, instead of using make one right and make one left, the designer says left increase or right increase. And then I had to read the instructions for what that meant and then realize, oh, that's a make one right or a make one left. Or a few little things like that, the difference between calling something like a, a right leaning or a left leaning cable versus like front and back versus um, right and wrong. Little knitting conventions like that, but it's a clear pattern. The cable is charted and I like it. Every time I knit cables, I remember that I really like knitting cables, but then I always am intimidated by them. And then I think I have no cabling experience, even though I have a cabled sweater and cabled socks and cabled headbands and now this as well. And yeah, something that also surprised me at first was that you start with the front instead of the back because, and this is not a right or a wrong thing, it's just a convention that every top down drop shoulder or similar pattern I've knit start, has you start with the back. I don't know if there's any particular reason why, maybe just so if you make any mistakes when you're getting used to it, they're on the back and not the front. But I've actually really enjoyed knitting the front panel first because the front panel has the cables and the back panel doesn't. And so the cables I find really enjoyable and make this quite potato chippy because there's a short interval between the cables, but it's very easy to remember the pattern. And so I think, oh, I should just get to the next cable pattern. And then I think, oh, I just need to do a couple more rounds to get to the next cable pattern. And then quite a bit gets done, even though this is knit a 32 stitch gauge and I was otherwise quite intimidated to knit two fingering weight camisoles in rib at the same time and I'm hoping that by the time I finish the front panel and put it on hold and start the back panel it will be a nice break to do just plain rib instead of the cable. I have the cable to look forward to again once I join them in the round so I think that it's clever in terms of managing knitting enjoyment and varying what you're doing to have a start with the front. 
I did, you're supposed to start on, start with a provisional cast on here. I chose to do a regular long tail, not because I don't like a provisional cast on, but because my thinking, and correct me if I'm wrong, you guys know I love input and corrections because I am still a pretty new knitter. A provisional cast on is going to have every stitch offset by half anyway. So the ribs pattern would not flow perfectly from that point on the shoulder from where I pick up the provisional cast on and then start hitting the back shoulders. And also this is a cotton merino blend. It's 70% cotton, which is a heavier fiber that also stretches and drapes a lot. And even though this is the exact same meterage as their 100% wool base, I've knit a fair amount of cotton camisoles or tank tops, and they do kind of weigh themselves down. And I want that extra little bit of stability that comes from a picked up shoulder seam than a provisional, than a provisional one. This is in the color Soft Aqua. I got it on sale at Unit at the end of August, and I just bought a third ball, now on sale for Easter, to finish it because I'm pretty sure that two balls of this, which is 500 meters, is not going to be enough for the whole camisole. I'm knitting the second size. I was just barely within range of the second size, but I would prefer this to be looser than narrower, I think, because I like the look of it with a little bit more ease. I think it looks a little bit more casual, laid back, beachy elegance than a super tight fitted ribbed camisole. I have a lot of small needle tight gauge summer projects lined up and I think that this is a good one to start with for what I like in knitting. And my friend is knitting at the same time. She's much farther than me. She's done the front and back panels and has been joined in the round knitting the body for a couple weeks and I think has like four centimeters of it done. So it's fun because I'm knitting this with somebody else. So yeah, that's the twist loop camisole. I'm enjoying it so far. It's going by quite quickly because the cables are a lot of fun and I'm working not very many stitches but I know that once I join the front and back for the body, it's going to feel like it takes forever. My next work in progress is something you guys have seen before, and it is my Cassia Cropped Cardigan by Refined Knitwear, which I am knitting in Emily C. Gillies Mohair in the color Sandstone and Malabrigo Ultimate Sock in the color Rosalinda. And I've just been chugging along. I think I had just separated the sleeves and body when I'd show this to you and now I have maybe three and a bit inches, yeah. And I work on this when I feel like it. I am a bit less enthusiastic about this than I was before now that I'm thinking about the two camisoles, but sometimes I would like to just knit a couple rows of stockinette and this is perfect for that. It is something I would like to wear. I'm just not feeling it as much right now, knitting it, but I am knitting it, so that's nice. I do continue to encounter translation or just like mistakes in the pattern. Um, use of the word increase when the designer means decreases and other things like that that make me pay attention more. Nothing so far has gotten, I think, become an issue for actually producing the cardigan, but yeah. And my last whip is my acorn sock. This will have a very brief, this will be a brief cameo because it's a sock that you guys have seen minimal progress on <laughs> week after week for many months. But I've been working on building the heel flap and I have been really I have been really enjoying the toe up, heel flap, and gusset construction. So, yeah. Acorn sock. One other thing, an update on my trying different pearls 
experience, experiment this year. I have been knitting combination when I've been knitting flat and I planned on doing this. So the tentacles of the octopus and my entire cardigan, the pink one I just showed you thus far, have been knit combination, but I'd never done ribbing in combination. And I wasn't sure how my tension would change going from knitting combination flat to my standard style, the Western knitting, if that is the appropriate term, would change potentially going from that to in the round. So I knit the tiniest of swatches to see. And you can see here where I cut it. I'm such a miser sometimes. I really don't like to knit swatches in the round because so far it hasn't been an issue for checking gauge, but because then you can't use the yarn because you've cut it. So I knit for a while flat in combination to see how that would change my tension compared to when I switched to knitting in the round, which is the last five rows or six rows up here. And the answer, okay, you can see I just messed up the stitch. I'm really covering my mouth a lot today, sorry guys. You can see that I just uh, messed up the stitch pattern here, but and I don't think this happens. Yeah, this doesn't happen when I'm knitting regular ribbon around, but knitting combination, my last knit stitch of a knit column in rib, in combination, gets really stretched out. You can see here the difference between this bit where you have a really wide knit column versus right here when all of a sudden I start knitting in the round. And that's not happening for the other two. It's just here and it's on the wrong side as well. You can see that quite clearly. And it's bugging me. I re-downloaded Instagram to take a photo of this and solicit advice. And everyone, or most people, sent me to Norman of Nimble ne Needles video all about rib. And first of all, very helpful, very clear. Uh, I really enjoyed that video. I found him very soothing. Second of all, it didn't, the suggestion didn't work because most people said, and Norman's main advice is to knit that last purl stitch extra tight which has not really made a difference in the actual camisole that I've been knitting in that elongated knit column or to knit it through the back loop so that it's the space in between that, fur, that last knit stitch and that first purl stitch, the amount of slack you have is minimized. But the thing is, is that already happens when I knit continental because the purl stitch is mounted opposite, which means that the working yarn connecting the two of them is much shorter than it otherwise would be. And nothing I've been able to do has been able to fix this, and it is bugging me. I've tried switching how I purl that last, that first purl stitch after every knit column. I've tried knitting it so tightly. I've tried twisting it and then untwisting it. I've tried doing a regular continental pearl. I've tried doing an Eastern combination pearl and I'm just finding that maybe it's just this yarn, but I doubt it. There's something about my knitting tension in combination that means that this last knit stitch is wide and ugly compared to these. And I'm really hoping it's not super noticeable in the camisole when I then switch to knitting in the round. I am once again asking for advice. If anyone has any other ideas, especially combination knitters, have you encountered this problem specifically? I would be very invested in hearing your feedback. But beyond that, I've kind of given up a little bit and it is what it is. All right, so those are all of my current and recently finished projects. I don't have any acquisitions, but I do have a library book section that I'm excited to show you guys soon. However, I feel that this is now an appropriate time to discuss the carpet beetle problem. If you don't like bugs, skip ahead. I will have timestamps down below 
and little chapters in this video so you don't have to hear about bugs. Aaron, I'm talking about you, spare yourself. Don't listen to me talk about bugs. Okay. So on Sunday night, six days ago, I had done three loads of laundry. I'd washed pretty much all my dirty clothes and also my bed sheets. And I was putting everything away and I found a little brown worm and freaked me out because I found it on my bed sheet, which I had just cleaned. And I had left it out to dry, kind of draped over my bed, touching the floor a little bit. And in the two hours that it was out, a little, little, little thing uh, got on my bed sheets. And I'm usually not very afraid of bugs. I've lived in way too many old, poorly sealed houses to kind of survive if I hate bugs. And I just try and think of them as tiny animals and they have their own thoughts and feelings. And I have mine and we mind our own business. But this worm was not minding its own business. It was on my bed sheet. So I freaked out. I took a, I took a picture and I looked it up and I am 98% sure it was a black carpet beetle larva. And then reading about carpet beetles and how destructive they are and how their larva will eat absolutely everything, especially protein fibers and how they eat wool and they eat leather and they eat lint and they eat hair, I freaked out. And of course, I didn't discover this at a reasonable time at any point on Sunday when I was just cleaning and studying and knitting. I find out at 11.30 p.m. when one of my roommates is already asleep. And the main advice that people give to deal with carpet beetles is clean. Clean, clean, clean. Make sure there is no lint or hair or anything around that could be a potential food source for them. And then clean to make sure you get rid of all the potential eggs that could be around. And so I couldn't vacuum because my roommate was asleep because it was 11.30 p.m. on a Sunday night, on a work night. So I am sweeping, I am mopping, I am wiping the floors. I am in uh, very close to a panic and I look and I find a couple more live larvae and like shed skins in the corner of my room. But that's near where I had a, a basket of yarn left over from when I discussed my 2023 knitting plans. I didn't put a lot of the yarns back into the sealed bags, plastic Ziploc bags I normally keep my yarn in because I was lazy, I guess, and I like seeing yarn. And I foolishly thought in the dead of winter there would be no moths to eat my yarn, but I did not expect carpet beetles. Because everyone I've raised I've told about this infestation has said to me, wow, I've never heard of carpet beetles before. Neither had I. So in the basket in the corner, I also had kind of a bowl of scrap yarns that I use when I put like sleeves on hold or straps on hold or anything, you know, like, um, you know, those few inches or, or a couple yards of yarn that you end up with when you snip tails or weave and ends or just run out of a ball of yarn. I usually keep those handy either to stuff stuff toys with, there are some, but mostly polyfill, thank goodness, in the octopus or in, I use them for putting stitches on hold because I don't often want to use spare cords because I don't have very, very many cords and I'm usually using them for projects. And I don't know, I think I, I've had this thing about throwing stuff away. I feel like I'm just sending things to landfill that would otherwise be avoided. So I just kept them and I usually find a use for them, but they were out. They were out exposed to bugs. And so I ended up tossing a fair amount of yarn, not fully intact skeins. All of my nice yarns, everything that's been given to me as a gift or that I bought that is special or that's an untreated wool or mohair or alpaca or surrey silk or silk is in sealed Ziploc bags in the closet behind me. So I wasn't concerned mostly about my yarn stash. I was concerned about my stuff and having a bug infestation because I've had a pantry moth infestation in the past and I'm still like, it was such a, uh, my, one of my ex roommates brought in an infected bag of quinoa and we just kind of didn't realize for like too long. And then dealing with the, the consequences of that took me a very long time. It was very upsetting. So second I found one and realized it was a carpet beetle, I was on high alert. I was cleaning and I'm really glad that I did because I found 
the early stages of an infestation. And had I just thought, oh, it's only one worm, only one larva, it's fine. I would have had a serious problem in my on my hand in a couple weeks. But it meant like a bunch of five to 10 gram leftover scraps of Drops Alpaca or Jameson and Smith that I use for my mom's mittens or little things like that. A few grams of the Green Mountain Spinnery weekend wool. All of those are now composted. <laughs> and all the things that were not compostable that are super wash or have an acrylic or nylon content are in the garbage. And I don't like throwing things out. Realizing that I can compost wool in Ottawa, that does make me feel better about it because it will go into compost, it will go into enriching our soil. And I did double check because when I went to that weaving workshop a couple months ago, the instructor said, you can compost what's left or you can use it. And that kind of made me think, oh, you can compost wool because I don't think you can in Toronto or Montreal, or I just didn't realize, but I looked it up and you can, and I snipped it to make it kind of maybe break down faster and it's in the compost and it's gone. And then what couldn't be composted is in the garbage. And then the basket of yarn, of nice yarns that I love, and have not been used and are not really scraps are in the freezer and they will be in the freezer for three weeks and yeah it sucked it was one of those moments where i thought oh no oh no oh no i really don't want to have beetles in my house i don't want to have them eating my leather my bedding my yarn but it was also a moment where I thought, okay, I can, I can handle this. I can nip this in the bud. I know what I'm doing. I'm enough of a grown up. I'm not going to cry. <laughs> so my room is as spotless as it's been in a while. A lot of scrap yarns are now just gone. And a lot of other things have been wiped down or are in the freezer until further notice, until I can wipe them down again. And that is that. So I didn't keep track of the yarn that comes in and out of my stash by grams, the way that I have been for acquisitions or things I've used in projects or given away to friends, because that was so not the priority. The priority was no food source for the larva. And I found a bunch of dead larva and exoskeletons by the scrap yarns. So that was like another important lesson that there is more to fear than just moths and not to keep wool out. Even in March, when everything is dead or hibernating. So important lesson, a bunch of yarn is now, scrap yarn is now gone and everything is sealed, washed, scrubbed, vacuumed. And I will continue to vacuum every day until I leave to go visit my family. And I will continue to wipe and I will continue to have this place smell like an essential oil shop to uh, ward them off from thinking this is a hospitable environment to lay their eggs again. But this is a warning to all of you. There's more to fear than moths, than closed moths. Uh, make sure that you don't have carpet beetles or I'm not creating an, an environment that's hospitable to carpet beetles as well. Yeah, that's my carpet beetle update. It was gross and I didn't like it, but it was also a moment where I thought, okay, I can handle this. It's nice to think that you are capable of dealing with something that sucks. It's also another reason why, oh, a, a bunch of my swatches compost. Because what am I, uh, another reason why I don't typically leave wool out on display, but I was just kind of lax over the winter. And this was a lesson that in Ottawa, that's very swampy in an old apartment building that is not properly sealed and that I don't have a lot of control over, like the wider building and the wider environment, wool stays in sealed, is clean and stays in sealed environments that are bug unfriendly. And I have everything splashed with lavender and peppermint oil. I have bags of cedar and I'm just very glad that I washed everything before I put it in storage too, to make it unwelcoming to bugs. So yeah, that's my bug story. Know what carpet beetles look like avoid them if you can. Okay, on to not acquisitions, but library books. I like libraries, who doesn't? And it did hit me that the library is going to have knitting books. But I started knitting in 2021. I've always been a very internet knitter. 
Does that make sense? I mean, I have a YouTube channel where I talk about this. I'm, most of my knitting friends are internet knitting friends. And most of the patterns I'm exposed to are via Instagram or Ravelry or YouTube. So I don't often think about the fact that beyond the books that I have that everybody talks about, like um, 52 Weeks of Socks or Charming Colorwork Socks, there's not a lot of knitting books I think about. Okay, I'm just going to remove the hold tag sticker on this. But I have wanted to knit a full cabled, traditional, big, cozy Aran sweater for a while. And I just, I've not been able to find a pattern that really calls to me. Turns out I'm kind of picky with cables. I don't know why. And I think it's because the conclusion I've more or less come to is that modern cable patterns don't appeal to me a lot. I want a variety of textures. I want a variety of cables in one sweater. And I don't really like honeycomb cables very much. I just, I don't like the shape of, I don't know, kind of, I don't know. And so that made me think the best place to look are older knitting books. And once I started looking up the Ottawa Public Library System's catalog of knitting books, I, I found quite a bit that was interesting to me, even outside my quest for a pretty cabled sweater. I'm also thinking now that it approaches warmer weather and I don't live in an air conditioned apartment, uh, a thick woolly cabled sweater is probably going to be on the back burner, but it's been fun to explore the library catalog of knitting and broader craft books and start scoping out what kinds of patterns I would be interested in knitting. And also as I am trying to spend less on knitting due to my financial constraints and situation and the fact that I have more than enough yarn, even with having to get rid of some stuff because of the beetles. It just doesn't make sense for me to be buying stuff right now. That is a reminder that libraries are a great way to get patterns for free and to make knitting more accessible and to remind all of you guys that that's true too. Most of you are probably going to say, yeah, duh, Rachel, but I don't know. I've been really happy about this discovery or this reminder and just seeing what's out there. And I also requested a couple knitting books from the OPL and that'll be really fun too. Because there are, there's a Norgon pattern in the Lina magazine publication Worsted, which is a pattern book curated by Amy of La bien -Aimie. And there's a Norgon pattern in that book called Perennial, which you can only get in that book. But I don't really want to knit anything else in that book. And I also don't want to buy a book that will just kind of be one pattern and then collect dust in my house. So I requested that book. I hope that they listen. I don't know if they will. And books are fun. So the ones that I got, Erin Knitting by Alice Starmore gorgeous. I love the 50 odd pages of history that this book starts with. I love the anatomy of different types of cabled stitches that it starts out with, and I like the patterns. I don't know if any of these are my perfect cabled pattern, but there are a few strong contenders or elements that I would like to take to then make a cabled sweater, because I thinking i'm thinking that this cabled sweater that lives in my dreams will not be a top-down raglan it will probably be either knit in panels or knit bottom up and i'm okay with that because i'm not looking for a very precise fit i want something oversized i want them something snuggly i think this one on the back which i'm pretty sure is the saint bridget but i'll double check by looking at it soon this is just a nice photo i really really like this one I would change the neck, but I love the cables in it. Doesn't that one look fun to knit? The way that I first came to this is I do admire Alice Starmore's books. While looking for more of her work, I found that she's apparently a, an early internet controversial knitting figure, which I, I love internet history, so that's fun. But one of my friends has another one of her books called fisherman sweaters or fisherman knitting that we looked through recently and I really enjoy which made me extra excited to pick this one up 
and we're gonna look through this one together too. And she knit, it's funny, the first, the, the pattern that I most, from the Fisherman Sweaters book, that I most, I was most drawn to is the one that she made from that book, which I thought was funny that we have the same taste, uh, was, okay, so I was on Ravelry looking for cabled sweaters and there's one that I saw on Ravelry, but that wasn't available as a digital pattern, but was in this book, which then led me to see that this is a book all about intricate, old fashioned, old style cabled sweaters in the Aran knitting tradition. And that seemed right up my research alley at this moment. But it's the Irish moss pattern. I, again, looking at it, I don't know if I want this one. This is another version of that same Irish moss. But I think it's beautiful. And I find a lot of these to be really beautiful and very inspirational and is getting me excited about knitting different things and tackling different things. And yeah, okay, the one, it is the St. Bridget. I like that, I think. There's one pattern on here, in here, which is a wrap. Alice Starmore writes that this one is a shawl because the cable pattern was too big for a sweater, which is a shame because I really like it and I would like it in this sweater. So maybe I adapt it and I remove a couple sections, but you can kind of see it here. And I am just really happy that the library gives me access to this book that's been out of print for a long time and has a lot of what I'm looking for because there are even if I was not interested in those patterns, I could find a basic sweater pattern and see if I could apply some of the cables that she gives charts for unconnected or outside the patterns onto that pattern. And she does have a section that talks about how to build your own sweater. And I really appreciate that. On this cabled train, I also picked up Judith Durant's 94 Knit Cables, Cable Left, Cable Right book, source book. And I'm going to look through these. The thing is, is, yeah, you have, it's very straightforward and I appreciate it a lot. It's very clear and it lays flat, which is something that I really appreciate in a knitting book because I like 52 weeks of socks, but it always wants to close on me. These are nice. They're clear. I don't like this, it makes me uncomfortable. Brains are so strange. There's two color cables. I, I think this is a great resource. The thing is, is it feels, I, am, I, am I allowed to photocopy from this and use it later? Or do I have to just keep it checked out until I'm ready to knit this cabled sweater or return it and pick it up again? This would be a cute sweater for a kid. if I had a kid to knit for. And I'm pleased. I also got Knits from Northern Lands by Jenny Fennell. This is outside of that cable mission because I just kind of like what was on the cover. I really like this low contrast color work scarf. There's a matching hat in here too. I don't think I have the yarn in stash for this, but I think I will photocopy the pattern for another moment because I like it and I would like to knit an all over color work scarf. I think that'd be a lot of fun and be a very wearable way to scratch my ongoing color work itch. I also really like this pillow. There is a cabled blanket in this that is another cable pattern that's too big for a sweater, but I really, really like and would like for a sweater. But I do like this book and I like the patterns in it quite a bit. There's almost no garments, but I like accessories. This is the In the Company of Cables blanket. Gorgeous. So I am tempted to maybe just take out a few sections of cables and see if I can make that into a sweater. Feels like a risky endeavor though, but I like 
experimenting sometimes. And then the cover, the cover photo scarf is the sheltered in Scandinavia scarf. So yeah, this is just an exploration of some of the resources available to me via the library to advance my knitting and to enjoy it at low or no cost. And I encourage you to see what's available to you in your local library as well. And let me know. And let me know what books you think I should check out and read next. Either to get a better understanding of theory of knitting, or more source books or things that you might think would be useful to me as someone who's looking to knit a traditional cabled sweater and so far has been drawn to older patterns or other older designers that, that me as a knitter who only took up knitting in the last couple years might not be aware of but would be very useful. I am aware of Elizabeth Zimmerman and I did read Knitting Without Tears and it did change my perspective and I do quote it to my friends on a regular basis but yeah okay so thank you so much for joining me of course I somehow still hit an hour I hope this was fun I hope you're having a good spring or autumn if you're in the southern hemisphere I hope that you and your loved ones are doing well and we'll talk again soon okay bye